Hi everyone, this is part two of our video lectures surrounding our topic of fat and lipid metabolism for lecture 10 of this 103. And in this video, what I want to focus on is the glyoxylate cycle as a means of converting fatty acid derived acetyl-CoA back into sugars. So our learning goals for this video is we want to be able to explain why animals are actually not able to accomplish the net synthesis of glucose from fatty acids while other organisms can. And we want to be able to describe the key reactions by which we can distinguish the TCA cycle that we already learned about and the glyoxylate cycle. So one of the key questions you want to ask here is, what about making glucose from fatty acid derived acetyl-CoA? We had talked about the breakdown of lipids and fatty acid beta oxidation, all leading into acetyl-CoA. We also had talked about our need to generate glucose in the cell, especially for organs such as the brain that are dependent on glucose. So it seems to be a good idea that we would be able to turn acetyl-CoA around and make glucose from it. But the reality actually is animals, including us, cannot achieve this. We cannot actually do the net biosynthesis of glucose from acetyl-CoA. Other organisms are more accomplished than us in this particular case. Plants, bacteria, and fungi actually can do this. So we want to really look at how do they do this. What is different in these organisms that allow them to produce glucose from acetyl-CoA in a net manner? So to do so, we have to first sort of remind ourselves how the TCI cycle works, right? the utilization of acetyl-CoA. In the last lecture, we had talked about fatty acid beta oxidation and its breakdown product acetyl-CoA. Much like the acetyl-CoA from our PDH reaction downstream of glycolysis, we would feed this into the TCA cycle, right? would move through the cycle, and in the process of our two decarboxylation reactions here, from isocitrate to alpha-KG and alpha-KG to succinyl-CoA, we relieve these carbons from the acetyl-CoA, the two carbons are being removed in form of carbon dioxide. As a result, we have no net gain of carbon in the TCA cycle while running acetyl-CoA through it. This now is an obvious problem, right? If you want to biosynthesize sugars, you need to get carbon from somewhere. So if we have a net carbon gain in the cycle and we need to obviously continue to run the cycle to make ATP, but we have no net carbon gain, we need to get carbon from somewhere. And so how would we go about this? If we wanted to do glucose, at least theoretically, what we would do would we would help us with our gluconeogenesis, right, GNG. So remember how we did this, right? In this case, we would remove oxaloacetate, OAA. We would use our PEPCK enzyme to convert it into PEP, for example, then we could use GNG to make glucose. That all looks good so far, right? But if we want to run the TCA cycle for energy purposes, so running it as a cycle, regenerating OAA, we need to bring OAA back into it. And we had talked about two possible reactions, one of which we had the enzyme for, to bring back oxaloacetate. So you might want to dig in your memory of our discussions on anapleurotic reactions. So the way we do this, we're coming from pyruvate, right? We're using pyruvate carboxylate, we carboxylate pyruvate to OA, we bring it back in. Still seems all possible, right? We have the enzymes, we can do it. But the big question and the big problem now is where do we get pyruvate from, right? Our way of getting pyruvate is a pyruvate kinase, the last enzyme in the glycolytic pathway, and that's coming from PAP, right? This is reaction 10 of glycolysis. We have to have this enzyme to refeed pyruvate, otherwise there is no carboxylating pyruvate to make OAA. So this is actually what we call futile cycling, right? There is just no net carbon here to siphon anything off. We are completely cycling these metabolites we cannot actually do this reaction. Right? So this is the reason we just don't have the enzymes available to bring about the production of glucose from acetyl-CoA in the net manner. Other organisms do. Animals cannot do this because of this issue of feudal cycling around refilling of the TCA cycle 
of OAA in this case if you were to take it out for gluconeogenesis and the production of glucose. So if other organisms can do it, how do they do it? They actually have another cycle that we introduce, need to introduce here. Right? Plants, bacteria, and fungi can actually make glucose from acetyl-CoA. They can do so in a net manner, and they use a new cycle for this called the glyoxylate cycle. It's actually very similar to the TCA cycle. It requires only two new enzymes. And what these enzymes allow these organisms to do is that they bypass the decarboxylation reactions of the TCA. So they prevent the carbon loss from happening. As a result, they actually accomplish a molecule of four carbons that then can be released as a TCA cycle intermediate. That's succinate, you have heard that from when we discussed the TCA cycle. And this now is surplus carbon coming out of this glyoxylate cycle that can be used for any kind of biosynthetic purposes, including glucose. So let's have a look and compare the glyoxylate cycle to the TCA cycle. So on the right here, a little bit smaller, I have the TCA cycle. On the left here, I have the glyoxylate cycle. And again, this occurs in plants, bacteria, and fungi with some small differences. Mostly we focus here on the example in plants. So if we look what's happening, right? This first step here looks very familiar. You have acetyl-CoA coming in and OAA coming in through the citrate synthase. You're making citrate. This is the exact same reaction here as your TCA cycle. Then we have our aconitase, and we're making isocitrate right here. Again, exactly the same reaction occurs here in the TCA cycle. But now we're coming to these two reactions here in the TCA cycle. Right? These are our decarboxylation reactions from isocitrate to succinyl-CoA. And so these we want to now bypass. And the way we do this is that we're bringing in our first new enzyme, the isocitrate lyase. It's a lyase, so you can imagine what it does. It will actually cleave something. And what it does is that it breaks down this molecule here, which has six carbons, and it will release succinate as a four carbon intermediate. This will actually leave the cycle. And you generate a two carbon intermediate glyoxylate. This is what the cycle is named after. So now you have lost some carbon here because you just removed four carbons in the succinate that you now want to use for biosynthesis of other molecules. So you have to bring in two carbons and we do this by bringing in another molecule of acetyl-CoA here. So two carbons here. Our second new enzyme called the malate synthase. And now combining acetyl-CoA and glyoxylate in the condensation reaction, you are going back to a four carbon intermediate that we know as our last intermediate before we're recycling OAA in our TCA cycle. So with just two enzymes, we could effectively bypass the decarboxylations. In addition, by bringing in one more molecule of acetyl-CoA, we in total generated a surplus of four carbons that now can be used for other reactions. But keep in mind, right, this comes at a price because in the decarboxylation reactions here in the TCA cycle, we also generated our NADH cofactor with the electrons in it as electron carriers for ATP production. And we're bypassing the pathway all the way to malate here. So in addition, we are bypassing the succinyl CoA to succinate step, so we're not making this GTP, and the succinate to fumarate step, so also the production of FADH2 is bypassed. So we're bypassing completely the energy producing steps of the TCA cycle in favor of generating a new molecule so that we have carbon available for other purposes. So it does come at a price. So now let's look at this in a bit of a bigger picture, right? We wanted to use plants as an example. So why would plants do this if it's so energy inefficient? Why make glucose? Glucose really is important in germinating plants Right. We had talked about seeds containing a lot of oil as an energy resource for plants to germinate before they reach the light, so break through the soil and can do photosynthesis. So in order to generate the main carbohydrate that plants use to transport through their system as an energy resource, which is sucrose here, sucrose needs one molecule of glucose, so we need to make glucose. So they are really dependent on this cycle. So how does it work? 
right? You have a lipid body here. So here are your fats stored in the seeds now. We mobilize those fats just as we had discussed in the last lecture. We can generate acetyl-CoA from beta oxidation. Acetyl-CoA now enters the glyoxylate cycle just as we had discussed right now. We're releasing succinate as our surplus carbon. This now can be transported into the mitochondria and can actually enter the TCA cycle. What we actually want to do here is we want to convert it into malate because malate can be shuttled across membranes too. So malate really is a very good metabolite if you want to shuttle electron-rich metabolites. That's exactly what we want to achieve here. We prefer to use malate. Malate can be transported into the cytosol. That should ring a bell, right? This was a malate shuttle we used for gluconeogenesis. Right? Remember we're dealing with amino acids, for example. So we're helping ourselves with this shuttle here. We're going into GNG via oxaloacetate all the way up gluconeogenesis. We can make glucose here. And if you remember our brief video on how we can produce disaccharides, right, we can interconvert glucose and fructose, and we can then with those two monomers produce sucrose. So a nice, nice tight cycle here, how plants can actually utilize this glyoxylate cycle to generate the sugars they need that are essential, especially at the early stage of development. And if you look at this sort of in real life, here's actually a microscope image of how this works. So it's basically the scheme on the left in a real world microscope picture. So here you have a lipid body full of the lipids in the seed, and then right adjacent to it, so the membranes are actually touching, you have a glyoxysome. This is a compartment that has the glyoxylate cycle. And then right next to that, we have our mitochondria where the TCA cycle sits. And so this is also important, right? The complementalization of the glyoxylate cycle and the separation of the TCA cycle and the glyoxylate cycle is really important so you don't have interference of both cycles because they're using many of the same reactions, but have very different purposes. So you want to keep them separate for this purpose. So this concludes our section on the glyoxylate cycle. For studying, make sure you understand the original TCA cycle reactions and are able to now look at what is different in the glyoxylate cycle. How do we bypass these decarboxylation reactions? And also what does it mean for our energy production in terms of our um, electron carriers and ATP production.